Let's next talk about our single subject designs. Uh, so, kind of tricky here, um, what a single subject design means is that the design, um, the experimental design is, uh, is done completely with one subject. Or instead of one subject, let's say each subject. Because we can have multiple subjects in a single subject design. I know it sounds like a little reverse, um, but all we would do is that if we have multiple subjects, we would repeat the experiment with all of our subjects. So you can have as many as you want, but if you get past like three to five, sometimes that can be a pretty time consuming and um, expensive, both time wise and money wise, um, experiment to run. Okay. Oh, yeah. We also um, had Alyssa put schedules of reinforcement here. We can definitely talk about those a little bit. I'll nerd out about schedules all day. Um, so let's get back to single subject designs. So um, the design is com done completely with each subject. Let's compare this to a group design. In uh, group design, what we do is we have a uh, large... Uh, Let's do this in bullets instead. So we have large group of participants. We split, uh, split them into two groups. So we have our test and control. The control group receives a placebo intervention. And then obviously the test group would receive um, the tested intervention. And then we compare the average effects between the two groups. So with single subject designs, we're taking the data on each individual and we're exploring the individual factors that affect the behavior of the individual um, and not um, someone who is similar to our individual. So you'll find out like what once you go exploring like the scientific realm a little bit more that most people actually hate single subject designs. They believe that the group design and more specifically the RCT, the randomized control trial is like the only and the best way to run any experiment. But what we've um, found out and Skinner really did a ton of work to uh, bring single subject designs into normal science and academia um, is, is that we're actually exploring like the factors that affect the individual and that's huge because uh, and we can know like what actually is going to change this behavior and we have really solid and tight data to prove it if we do our um, experimental design right. So um, there's still a constant battle to this day on single subject designs, but um, it's kind of our mission to uh, make this a more acceptable approach and show that we can really um, have amazing data that does have external validity as well, even if it's with a single subject design. But the uh, main benefit is that we can really dive into those individual factors that affect each individual and each behavior of each individual that's relevant. Awesome. Um, so I don't know how deep we want to go into um, single subject designs right now. Uh, we do have four main types within, that we usually use in behavior analysis. So we have the withdrawal reversal design, um, the alternating treatments design, multiple baseline, and then our changing criterion design. So if we were to go into all of these and really like break down the details of it all, uh, we would easily spend the rest of the session doing it. Um, so I'm just gonna go through like maybe a couple quick points and highlight a couple details uh, for you to that maybe you uh, haven't thought about before. Um, so hopefully this is still useful, but we're gonna go fairly fast. So in the withdrawal design, like um, we um, switch between um, baseline and intervention phases. Um, to test out um, the effects of an independent variable on a dependent variable. Um, usually you can think about our independent variables as treatments, and then our dependent variables, just replace that with behaviors. 
Um, this this made these terms a lot more approachable to me. Like whenever I saw IV, I'm like treatment. Whenever I saw DV, I just read it behavior. Um, so that was a really helpful trick for me because otherwise it's easy to get those two mixed up. They kind of generalize because both of them have dependent variable. Just one has two letters in front of it. So that's really easy to mix those up and it's kind of cool to observe like the properties that create that too. Okay. So um, when we're doing this, we um, when, uh, when we phase change is kind of important. So what we want to see is either um, like a stable trend in data uh, for two to three data points, um, or we can also phase change um, when uh, the data is trending in the opposite uh, direction intended for the next phase. So let me give you an example. Um, so we, let's say we have um, behavior of concern is increasing in baseline. Um, this is an okay time to implement intervention. So that works because the problem's getting worse. So if our intervention decreases this to zero, it's almost more impressive uh, than anything else. Cool, I'm just catching up on chat a little bit. Awesome. Yeah, Karina likes that tip, like independent intervention. That's great. Love that. Um, so that's pretty quick for our um, phase change there. And if we think about the utility, if we don't want to, um, we have to be careful with severe or dangerous behavior. Uh, BAB can be better, um, but has some limitations still. And so it requires like removal of intervention. And then we cannot uh, use this for behaviors that cannot be unlearned. So if I'm teaching like a skill, like teaching a kid like um, how to ride a bike without falling um, for a specific amount of time. So um, I can't like remove the effects of that intervention. So I can't show experimental control because uh, to do a reversal design, we need to reverse back to the original condition and then see behavior go with it to know for a fact that our thing is the thing that's changing it. Cool. Um, alternating treatments design. Everybody just tells me the key features that you can use a lot of treatments. But you know, like you can do that in withdrawal design too. Um, so really the key feature to focus on is that we're rapidly alternating between our treatment conditions. So uh, pretty much every phase uh, or every session, we do a new treatment. Um, so that's really the key feature you wanna focus on. Uh, it's not so much the number of interventions, it's more about this rapid alternation. Um, some other features, baseline is optional. Um, if we talk about like the utility, this makes it a good design um, for severe or dangerous behavior. And another part of the utility is that we can quickly evaluate if something will work, uh, if something will work. So uh, let's look at that, uh, these features and how it relates to this utility. We can skip through a baseline. We don't need it at all. Um, oftentimes, instead of a baseline, uh, we, uh, we may rapidly alternate between a control condition. So if you look at like a functional analysis, for example, in, in FA, we use the uh, alternating treatments design 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, so that's a good thing to uh, kind of um, let sink in. If you see an FA graph, it's an alternating treatments design, um, almost certainly. Um, so think about an FA, the play condition is the control condition, and that's just kind of thrown in with the rest of the conditions that we're alternating between, and we don't necessarily need a baseline. Okay, okay. Um, also, I forgot, I, I posted something where uh, if we get 25 concurrent viewers before the end of this stream, so um, at least 40 more minutes, then I will give out a one hour tutoring session for free to somebody that is here. So right now we are halfway there at 13. So if you know some friends that are also studying, make sure to tell them that uh, we're here learning a lot uh, and that they should come and that they have a chance to win free tutoring if they do so. So tell your friends. Okay, um, so that's what we'll, all we'll talk about with uh, the alternating treatments design. 
multiple baseline design, I see where a lot of people get mixed up is that um, it, uh, the standard uh, multiple baseline design uses one intervention. So if you see more, you know it's a combination design. Uh, the visual identification of these is, uh, is I think, one of the simplest to find. So you want to look for the staircase pattern um, that is creating uh, um, different durations of baseline across our dependent variables. Also, I see a lot of uh, students just like not know what to call like the participant settings or behaviors. Um, the participant settings and behaviors are our dependent variables. So those are just our behaviors that we're tracking. So um, like don't confuse this with phases. So that would be like switching the intervention in play. Uh, really easy to um, confuse those. Um, and then it shows experimental control uh, by manipulating AB relationships across our DVs. So the more DVs, uh, the more experimental control. The more DVs replicated, there's more experimental control. Cool. You guys hanging with me? I know um, experimental designs can be a little uh, challenging to process and get through. How are you guys feeling? We've got one more, and then we'll move on to something else. Let's check out our changing criterion design. So this is used to gradually change behavior. So either increasing or decreasing. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, simple is like my mantra for anybody studying is simplify, simplify, simplify. Uh, there are just so many moving parts in behavior analysis, but uh, what we do in behavior analysis is really like break those down to its simplest relevant components, and then we um, kind of like see how those components interplay with each other. Um, so don't overthink things. Try not to overcombine things. Uh, just think one thing at a time. How does this work? How does that variable affect this? Um, and I tr trust me, like you will um, understand this so much more clearly and you'll feel so much more confident in your answers when you're um, taking mocks or on your exam. Okay, so changing criterion design, we use it to gradually change behavior, either are increasing or decreasing. Um, the visual identifier is you want to look for those horizontal prediction lines or goal lines. And typically, uh, behavior will hover around these goal lines. So um, they're always there, and that's our uh, quickest indicator. This one is really weird how it shows experimental control. So think about it. Um, with experimental control, what that is is that there is a clear, predictable, consistent effect when we implement a certain independent variable. It's going to have that effect on this dependent variable. So, for example, if I set my goal at three gym visits a week and I get three gym visits a week for two months straight, that's some pretty darn good experimental control. Um, if I were to move that to four and then my behavior adjusts to that immediately, four, also pretty good experimental control. But let's say I set it at three, one week I did two, one week I did four, one week I did one, then I did like seven days of working out one day. That means that this doesn't really control my behavior that much because there's so much randomness in this. Um, so what we want to look at is how well does the behavior conform to the level of the goal line? So if it um, is a good match with goal line, um, that is good experimental control. If it's all over the place, that's bad experimental control. And the intervention or like the results could be even better than what you set it at. So like I set it at uh, three workouts a week and then one week I did seven. Well, sweet, like that's a good clinical outcome that one week I did seven workouts, like, as long as I didn't like overstretch myself. Um, 
But the thing is that it's not a good experiment because it shows that this variable doesn't control the behavior at all. Hey there, Nick here. I hope you enjoyed that clip. If you did, make sure to like the video and subscribe so more people can see it. Also, if you're interested in any test prep services, check out my uh, store down below at understandingbehavior.shop. Laters.